So hi, my name is Jasmine McAllister. Um, if you're here, you probably know I'm going to be talking about um, data work at the New York Attorney General's office. Um, my team is called the Research and Analytics Department. Um, so I'm going to give an overview of our work, um, and then I'll have two example cases that I'll talk about. Um, I also, before I start, I also wanted to thank Beta NYC, um, Kate, our volunteer Kyle, thanks for helping out today, um, CUNY School of Law, it's great to have this venue, the Internet Society, who is helping record this session, um, and then, of course, the Open Data team with um, the city. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the office as a whole, just to kind of orient us, and then I'll get into the data work. Um, so the office has a f two main roles. Um, one, it's the people's lawyer, which is most of what my team works on. It's protecting people's rights, um, also our natural resources in New York State. Um, the office is also the state's chief legal counsel. Um, so if someone sues New York State, then um, some of the attorneys in our office would be responsible for defending the state. And then there are a couple regulatory functions as well. Um, we have offices throughout the state, uh, more than 1,800 employees, about half of which are in the New York City office, um, where I work in the financial district of Manhattan. Um, and then the office is divided into five main divisions for the legal functions. Uh, my team mostly works with economic, economic justice division and social justice division. Um, we work on civil matters mostly, um, but there's other um, divisions as well. Um, and then this is just a quick overview of kind of how the office fits in with the broader um, legal enforcement um, ecosystem. So there's the Department of Justice at the federal level. Um, there's other state attorney generals. We work with them a lot. Um, usually a state attorney general is either elected, like New York State Attorney General um, Tish James, or Tisha James. Um, some of you may have voted in that election. Um, and then, yeah, some attorney generals are appointed by the governor. Um, there's DAs that do criminal work at the county level. They're also elected. And then there's also specific agencies that enforce um, a certain subset of laws. Um, okay, so that's the office as a whole. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my team, which is the Research and Analytics Department. It was started in 2014. We were the first um, data team for an attorney general's office in the country. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, before that, and in other states, they usually um, hire outside companies to kind of help support that sort of work. Um, but yeah, because we're the first in-house team, we've supported a lot of multi-state investigations. Um, and I think since we were started, I think a couple other states do have data teams now. But, um, but yeah, we were the first almost 10 years ago. Um, we were originally three or four. Now the team is 11. Um, and yeah, it sounds like a lot of you work for the city, um, which is really awesome to have you guys here today. Um, our work is a little different than other um, government data positions because of the breadth of issues we work on. It's um, kind of a lot of different areas that we cover. Um, and then also, a lot of the time, our data comes from adversarial sources. Um, so it's someone that we're investigating where we subpoena their data. Um, we do use some publicly available data as well, including data sets available on Open Data um, NYC that I will highlight as well. OK, um, so this slide talk. Oh, also, I should have mentioned, um, if you guys, unfortunately, a lot of these slides are kind of text heavy. Um, I, I know you're not supposed to do that, but it's just easy for me to um, kind of keep track of what I'm talking about. But if you guys want to like look at more detail on any of the slides, um, it's on the, the schedule. Um, so yeah, so there's like the maps, and then there's a link under there to the PDF file of this. Um, so yeah, if it's helpful for people to follow along, feel free to find that. Um, OK, so what is our role? Um, so one thing that we do sometimes that I wish we did more, but is cool when we do, is strategic enforcement. So we might look at um, a data set about a whole industry, 
Um, and then from there, identify who are um, the right players to target in this industry um, investigation. So that's kind of the bulk of what we do. Um, once we identify a target, um, how can we demonstrate that whatever it is that they're doing is illegal? Um, quantifying the harms. So we've identified that what they're doing is illegal. Now, how bad was it? How many people did it harm? Um, can we translate that to a number in terms of a monetary amount? Um, exploring remedies. So is there a settlement number that makes sense? Um, and then how do we distribute that money to people who are harmed? Um, and another thing that we have done, but I wish we also would do more of, um, is um, making tools for the office, so ways um, for the office internally to connect and share data so the attorneys can look at it themselves, um, automating red flags, um, that sort of thing. Um, this is a case life cycle via data. Um, it kind of mirrors what we just talked about, but more in terms of the mechanics of the steps. Um, so the investigation begins. Um, the attorneys request or subpoena the data. Um, when that happens, sometimes we have input to make sure that the data requested is um, covering everything that we want and in a format that is easy for us to use, although that doesn't always happen, but uh, we hope for it. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes there's relevant public data we might use. That would be on my team to identify. Um, we load the data, perform the analysis. Um, present the data to the attorneys. Um, usually we do a lot more analysis than what ends up being used, um, but we'll kind of explore different paths with the attorneys um, and kind of make sure that what we're doing is consistent with how former cases have been done. Um, if there's not precedent, then we'll kind of look to the academic research or just like our own um, knowledge of statistics and make sure that it's uh, straightforward and easy to understand in a case um, to a judge. Um, but yeah, that's kind of that part. Um, yeah, and then ultimately it would go into a complaint um, if we file a lawsuit. And then there's either, either a settlement or litigation where we're going back and forth. And then at the end of the day, um, we want injunctive relief. So whoever, whoever it is that was doing something illegal, um, they stop doing that activity and um, money for people who were harmed or... Um, or sometimes if it's not directly to people who are harmed, um, like setting up programs um, that kind of counter whatever it was. Um, OK, so we work with a few types of different data. Um, the ideal is structured. So this is Excel um, and CSV. I think you guys are all very aware of that. Um, sometimes it's unstructured, like PDFs. Um, if it's a PDF, it'd be great if it were in a neat little table for us to extract, um, so that's a little bit easier. But sometimes it's quite messy, um, and that can be a challenge. Um, Gotham is my coworker. He's in the back here. Um, Gertrude's a former intern. Um, I think these folks are a little better at, at extracting the unstructured data um, than I am, but it's definitely part of our work. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, it comes from different sources. Most of it is subpoenaed. Um, but yeah, sometimes public data is part of the case. Um, sometimes we get data shared from other agencies. Um, so yeah, some New York State agencies share data with us. Um, we've had a federal agency share data with us. Um, yeah, sometimes that helps as well. Um, and it might be huge data sets, millions of records. Um, it might be kind of smaller data sets with just tens of thousands of records that we might merge together. And then occasionally it's much smaller. Um, you can work with it in Excel. Um, or sometimes, like in the small category, we have information about a sample within a population, but that just is a small part of everyone. It's just that sometimes it's like too um, too many rows to kind of be helpful. So we might extrapolate out from a sample. Okay, so as I mentioned, the team mostly works with the Economic Justice Division. Um, so within a division at the office, there's bureaus. Um, so yeah, we mostly work with the Economic Justice Division and Social Justice Division. These are some examples of um, economic justice bureaus. 
Um, so antitrust, that's kind of some of the big, big mergers you might have seen in the news. Um, Bureau of Consumer Frauds and Protection, that's um, where a lot of my work is. Um, so auto lending, we're going to talk about that later. Um, merchant Cash Advance is another financial product um, that we had a recent case about that. Um, and then price gouging has been a big part of our work. Um, so yeah, so during the pandemic, um, there were people who were charging way too much for um, like safety products that were needed during the pandemic. Um, so we showed that they were um, violating the law there. Um, what the law says is that you're not allowed to raise um, the price of products uh, an unconscionably excessive amount um, at, at a market disruption um, when it's like essential products that people need. Um, so yeah, so obviously the pandemic was very disruptive. Um, and yeah, in these price gouging cases, you'll kind of take the date of the market disruption. So um, in this case, when they declared an emergency for the pandemic, um, and then you'll take the price before and after and just show that it was a huge price increase. Um, we might do additional work on top of that to support the case. Um, like there's a um, defense that they can have where they're allowed to maintain profit margins on specific products. Um, and so we might do like that kind of analysis too to support um, if they raise the prices more than what was necessary to maintain their profit margins. Um, so yeah, so the um, like safety products during the pandemic, um, eggs also in the same year, there was price gouging on eggs. Um, Gotham worked on that case with Hellendale. Um, and then a recent one that we announced um, was there was the baby formula shortage in 2022. Um, so we announced um, one of our cases against um, someone who's price gouging for that too. Um, we also have the Bureau of Internet and Technology. Um, so a big part of that work is data breaches and how companies, um, A, didn't do the protections they were supposed to to keep people's data safe, and then B, how they handle that. Um, we have an analyst on the team who kind of focuses on that area. Um, and then another thing that we've done in that bureau is FCC fake comments. So in 2017, FCC was considering whether or not to um, repeal rules that protected net neutrality. And they invited the public to comment on that, um, what people thought. Um, the broadband companies were like, oh, no, people are going to say they <laughs> support net neutrality. So they hired some companies to um, kind of entice people to submit comments um, in favor of the repeal. Um, and they were um, like the companies were supposed to kind of offer like giveaways or gift cards or that sort of thing for people to submit those sorts of comments. Um, but what ended up happening is a lot of the comments that these companies um, got people to submit were actually not submitted by people. They were fake comments with um, some made up identities. Some were people's identities that had not asked to submit these comments. Um, a lot of that was kind of determined by the attorneys. But then part of that we worked on as well. There were comments. So we looked at the text of the comments, and there were certain comments that used kind of a Mad Libs format where it was, dear commissioner, dear FCC, I um, support the repeal because this. And they kind of just picked from a menu of how they would fill in this sort of Mad Libs style comment. Um, so yeah, so someone on our team um, kind of like did some analysis to show that that pattern was being used over and over again. And those were identified to be fake comments. Um, investor Protection Bureau. Um, so when we talk about investor protection, that's um, like retail investors, so like people's retirement funds, my retirement fund. Um, one of our targets was TIAA. So that is um, they manage teacher retirement funds, um, and they had tried to pressure people. Well, they did successfully pressure people to switch their accounts um, into a type of account that was higher fee and therefore more profitable for them. Um, so we kind of looked at who had met with these advisors from TIAA um, and how much more it cost people when they switched accounts. Um, and then Taxpayer Protection Bureau, we have not done a lot of work with them, but one example is um, when there's 
gift when there's a small balance on gift cards that's been open for a long time, um, the company is supposed to return that balance to the state. Um, H&M was not doing that, um, so we did some analysis to support that case as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the economic justice work. Social justice, um, so yeah, this is kind of another big division we work with. Um, these are the bureaus within that. There's the Charities Bureau. Um, so the main thing we'll look at here is embezzlement. Um, we might look at transactions and financial statements within a charity. Uh, civil rights, that's a big part of my work personally. Um, yeah, I think the thing I'll pull out here is um, voting access. So um, one case that we had a few years ago is um, in Rensselaer County where Troy is. It's near Al Albany. Um, they had early voting sites only in like the white kind of outer areas of the county, but where the city of Troy is, where most of the people of color live, they did not have early voting sites there. Um, so it was kind of straightforward to show, here's where your polling sites are, look at the demographics just according to census of um, the people who lived there, um, and we could show that it was not equally accessible to people. Um, so we sued the county, um, one, and then the next year for the election, they had to open more accessible early voting sites. Um, yeah, we also look at housing discrimination, police accountability, equal pay laws. That's all in the Civil Rights Bureau. Um, environmental protection. Okay, so this is a fun one because we have used open data. Oh, in some... We have used open data in some of those cases, um, which I know is kind of the point of this week. Um, so the two I'll talk about here is Verizon cooling towers and bus idling. Um, okay, so cooling towers is um, something that helps cool machinery um, and it uses water, but the temperature where that water is when it's cooling the machinery is kind of the ideal environment for a certain type of bacteria to thrive. And it's a really dangerous bacteria. It can give people a disease that can then progress to pneumonia. Um, ultimately, that can be fatal. So there's um, laws kind of regulating how much you have to inspect these plants. And if you find um, contamination when you do, then you have to remedy them. Um, so for this analysis, we took data on where the cooling towers were. And then the open data piece is we used Department of Health data to kind of match those up and show that, um, that Verizon was that there was a link between the department issues in the Department of Health data and where Verizon cooling towers were. Um, yeah, they were not performing the inspections they were supposed to um, and not addressing issues when they found them. Um, so, yeah, and actually there was an outbreak in the Bronx and two people died. So, yeah, so that was um, like a big deal. Um, OK, and then the other one I'll talk about in environmental protection is bus idling. Um, so I talked earlier about strategic enforcement where we might try to identify targets. Um, and bus idling is a case where we did that. So um, the data sources that we use here to kind of find out where there were problems were, one, air quality, um, two, 311 complaints, so where there were complaints about idling, and three, um, traffic tickets for idling. Um, so we kind of combined those data sources, found hotspots for idling, and um, and kind of like looked further into what was happening at those hotspots. And we discovered that there were a few bus companies where the drivers would just idle the car, um, idle the bus, um, and kind of cause unnecessary pollution when they were just parked there. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've in investigated those. We have a couple settlements and a couple ongoing investigations. Um, and then also within environmental protection, we've had some other cases, um, mostly dealing with contamination, um, people not following the rules they're supposed to. Um, okay, Healthcare Bureau. Um, so a big part of our work over the last few years has been um, an investigation into opioids manufacturers and distributors um, and their role in the opioids crisis. Um, so one part of the work with opioids is there's a rule where they're supposed to monitor if there are suspicious orders, and if they see that, they're supposed to flag it and look into it. 
and see why that is. Um, so, so what we did here is we took the data from different distributors and showed that if they were monitoring for things that were suspicious, there were some clear red flags that they just ignored. Um, so for example, if a pharmacy is getting tons and tons of opioids pills delivered, but not that many people even live in the surrounding area, that's a red flag that clearly should have been, they should have been looking into those shipments um, and they did not. Um, so yeah, data analysis was definitely important to that case. It's very huge. Gotham has worked on some of that. Um, and yeah, there was a case where Bilkin Hospital was billing people for rape kits. Um, so we supported that. Labor Bureau, a lot of those cases are wage theft. Um, so matching like time cards with payroll and showing that they don't match up. People's wages were stolen. Um, how much was that? Who was that? How many people were affected? Um, we'll do that sort of analysis. We had a big case with Uber and Lyft recently where um, there's a certain tax that the consumer was supposed to pay, but instead Uber and Lyft were just docking that tax amount from worker pay, um, which was not supposed to be happening. So um, we kind of did the analysis to look at um, how much money that was. Um, and then there was some Amazon COVID testing concerns at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, okay, so law enforcement misconduct investigative office. This is a um, an office that was started in 2020 in the wake of the racial justice protests. Um, they only focus on police accountability. Um, so they've kind of taken some of that work um, that civil rights was doing previously. And then finally, the Real Estate Finance Bureau. Um, we do do investigations into landlords that are doing illegal things. Um, that also uses um, open data. Shout out HPD. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's some of our work as well. Let's see if we have time for questions or if I should keep going. OK, I'm going to keep going, but there's going to be time for questions at the end. OK, so today we're going to talk about two cases. One is um, an auto lender, Credit Acceptance Corporation. Um, they were charging people way too much interest on loans to buy used cars. And the other one is the racial disparities in homeownership report. Um, so the first one relies on subpoena data. The second one includes mostly public data. OK, so a little background on um, this auto lender. They're a subprime auto lender for used car purchases. Um, most of the borrowers are low income, low credit. Some don't have credit scores at all. Even on the face of the loan document, the stated APR is really high. It's 23 to 24%, which is already a bad deal. Um, but most importantly, and this is the crux of the case, they're stating one loan principle that isn't even really true. Um, they'll say on the loan document that the loan is $10,000, but then they'll actually only give $8,000 to the used car dealer. Um, so we're asserting that that 2K difference between the $10,000 on the document and the $8,000 that's actually given to lend, um, we're asserting that that 2K difference should be treated like interest. It's a hidden finance charge. Um, and we kind of incorporate that into the calculations. Um, this is a joint case with CFPB, um, a federal agency that protects people in the realm of consumer finance. We focus on just New York. They looked at the whole country. OK, so preparing the data, I think this might be a little review for most of you. Um, but first, just defining the population. Um, we wanted to only look at loans that had reached the end of the loan term by the time they pulled the data. Um, so for example, we did have loans in the data we received where it was a loan that was given yesterday or a week ago. We don't want to include that because we can't observe like what happened to that um, during the full course of the loan. Checking for validity of values. I think a lot of you guys do that too, know what that means. And then finally, checking merging. So we had a few different data sets we were looking at. There was the loan level. There was the transaction level. And then there was outcomes. So like what happened? Were they repossessed? That sort of thing. Um, so we merged all that together and just checked to make sure that that was all matching the way that we expected. 
Okay, and this is really important. Um, so that hidden finance charge I was talking about, that 2K difference, we recalculated the APR to say, what would the APR be if we did include that hidden finance charge as interest? Um, the first step of that was just making sure that our method was consistent with the way that the company was doing it. Um, it's pretty standard to calculate APR in the same way, but we just wanted to check. Um, and yeah, the method uh, matched up. Um, but yeah, then we included that 2K as interest. And the median true APR, when you consider that difference, um, was 34%. Um, okay, so so our argument is that that interest should be considered. Um, normally, when you give a loan, the interest rate varies on how creditworthy the customer is. Um, and the stated APR on the loan documents was pretty much always 23 or 24%. So that's the red line um, across credit scores. They're saying we're giving the same interest to everyone. But when you look at the true APR and how much they inflated the principal, that does match with how you would normally account for um, risk in giving a loan. Um, and so, yeah, they inflated the, the principal more um, for lower credit borrowers. And that behavior is consistent with our assertion that um, it should be considered as interest. Um, we also looked for more evidence that um, the principal was art artificially inflated. Um, so if you look at um, just what the dealer received, so what we're calling like the true principal and then the um, down payment, um, if you look at that amount over the dealer costs, that gives you markup that the dealer used. And that was in line with industry standards for markup. Um, if you considered that extra 2K, then it would be like really high markups that um, that are not really like reasonable in how things work. Um, so that was another piece of evidence that what we thought was happening was indeed happening. Um, this slide is kind of, it's like a little more detailed than I think it makes sense to go into right now. But there was like theoretically another way that dealers could get money from these loans. Um, and we did kind of a lot of analysis to look at that different ways. Um, and like, Basically, the dealers don't really get this very much. Um, I'm kind of just including this slide to demonstrate that sometimes we might do a lot of analysis that doesn't really make it into the final complaint at the end of the day. Um, it was kind of, it was like one sentence, but it wasn't really a main part of the analysis or a main part of the complaint, even though we did spend some time looking into that. OK, bad outcomes for borrowers. So this, to me, was like the most interesting thing, one of the most important things. Um, because you know we're saying that these loans are way too expensive, but this is kind of showing how that really affects people um, and their lives in a really negative way. Um, so yeah, so more than half of borrowers became delinquent within the first year. Um, the company installs these devices that can disable someone's car in the event of a missed payment. Um, and they did use that pretty aggressively. They stopped using it in New York in 2018, um, but they did use it in the earlier part of the period. Um, and when they disable someone's car, that helps them repossess the car, which they do pretty frequently. Um, in our New York covered period, 44% of the cars were repossessed. A third of them were sold at auction, so the person never saw the car again. Um, and this happened relatively quickly, so these loans are supposed to be five or six years but for the cars that were um, repossessed and auctioned off, that usually happened in less than two years on average. Um, so yeah, very bad for people. And then on top of that, if the auction proceeds are less than the remaining balance, which remember was inflated, um, CAC sues the borrowers for the re remaining amounts. They send debt collectors. Sometimes people's wages are garnished and just the money is taken out of their bank account directly. Um, so yeah, it's super bad for people. Status of the case, so we submitted the complaint to the court, and we are now um, waiting to hear back from the judge about what will happen next. Let me see. OK, I'm going to keep going. OK, so the other case I'll talk about today is a report on the racial disparities of homeownership. Um, it's kind of a well-known issue. Um, that there's been a lot of research on. There is a publicly available data set. 
um, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data set that has data on um, something like 90% of loan applications in the United States. Um, and yeah, I mean, kind of the, the difference um, in our analysis is the public data has most fields, but there are some fields that um, are not public. Credit score is the most important one. Um, and we got access to that through CFPB. Um, and the purpose of this, of this report, so it's not an enforcement action, it's just talking about mortgages in general. And the purpose of this report was to help advocates fight for more just policies using that data that um, is usually not public. Um, and in this analysis, we looked at every stage in the loan application process. So getting applications, the approval or denial of applications, the pricing of the loan product and refinancing. And at every single stage um, in mortgage lending, we saw disparities. Okay, so first just getting the applications. Um, so what this map shows is the dots are bank branch locations and then the shading represents whether or not it's a um, neighborhood of color or not. And the beige is white neighborhoods. Um, and I don't know if you guys can see it from there, but all of the, most of the dots are in the white neighborhoods. And um, they're not even really establishing a physical presence in neighborhoods of color. And um, ultimately, just even at the application stage, um, people of color are underrepresented um, in the data. OK, next we're going to look at um, applications for, um, for home purchase, mortgages for home purchases. Um, and so this is kind of where one of the places we use that credit score data. Um, what we did here is we made a regression that controls for loan amount, credit score, debt to income ratio, loan to value ratio, and income. And, um, and yeah, we just um, looked at the odds of approval or denial controlling for all those things. The clusters of bars show each um, MSA. So like New York City and the surrounding area would be an MSA. Um, and the, the blue bar is the denial rate for people of color controlling all those factors for all those factors. The orange is for white people. Um, and as you can see in every MSA, the blue bar is taller than the orange bar. Um, so we're seeing people of color get denied these applications um, even when they're very similar borrowers. We also looked at the cost of credit. So one, they're more likely to be denied. Two, when they're accepted, they pay more. This is other costs and fees separate from interest. Um, and the blue bar shifted to the left is for white borrowers. The orange is for people of color. And then that kind of brown overlap is, um, yeah, is the overlap between the two. Um, and we can see that the blue is shifted left, the orange is shifted right, um, indicating that people of color are paying more in costs and fees, even when they get approved. This chart um, separates the type of loan um, by race. So for example, all of the FHA mortgages are um, in that second kind of cluster. Um, and we're seeing that the red bar is much lower than all the others, um, again, showing that white people are paying less in costs and fees um, for these mortgages. OK, so that's um, approval or denial, cost of credit. Then we looked at refinancing. Um, so interest rates were really low um, in 2020 and 2021, um, which was a good time to refinance for people to save money. Um, but we, we just looked at refinancing um, activity or application activity during that period. Um, and so what we did is we took the uh, refinancing applications we saw in 2020 and 2021 and compared that to the number of mortgages in, in each census tract. And then we compared that to the number of mortgages in each census tract um, in 2019. So that's how we estimated refinancing activity. You could do this with publicly available data. Um, and then again, we broke that out into MSA. And we're seeing that the blue bar, which represents white neighborhoods, just had more refinancing activity than neighborhoods of color, the orange bars. Um, in every MSA. This is zooming into a particular MSA. This is Albany. And um, here we're looking at um, 
the percent of people of color in a census tract on the x-axis and then the refinancing activity on the y-axis and we're seeing um, a negative relationship between the two um, so the last slide was showing just neighborhoods of color versus white neighborhoods there's a difference but here we're showing as um, a neighborhood has more people of color there's less refinancing activity Um, okay, so those are the applications. Now we're just looking at what happens um, when people do submit applications. And similar to the earlier slide, we're seeing that um, applications from neighborhoods of color are more likely to be rejected than um, in white neighborhoods. Okay, so um, status of this, we published the report last fall, I think in October or November. Um, I gave a presentation at a housing conference to people who advocate um, for policies in this area. The report also included some policy recommendations that um, the policy folks at our office came up with. Um, and yeah, our hope is that this report can be used to help sway laws and policies. That's it. Um, so yeah, I think we have quite a bit of time for questions. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, we're also hiring. You can go to the website, see that. Um, but yeah, if people have questions. Thank you. First of all, thank you. I voted in Troy right before the investigation. Oh, nice. That's the most part of the time for us. Um, it sounds like a lot of the legal action, especially, is focused on private entities and companies. And I was curious, I, I work at the city agency, the Department of City Planning. And I'm curious how often you all investigate agencies, I suppose, for not maybe doing activities that they're mandated to do. Yes. It usually comes up in like maybe the environmental section of things, but I'm just wondering if that's a problem. Yeah. Um, so to repeat the question for the recording, um, so the question was, it seems like a lot of what I talked about today was um, private actors, companies, how often do we investigate um, government agencies for not doing what they're mandated to do. Um, I don't know about the office as a whole. I think that my team's work, I think really just the voting stuff is um, is kind of what we've helped out on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably something we can investigate and maybe like the attorneys do that without like, I, I can't know all the cases in the office. Um, so maybe there's activity on that that I don't know about. But, um, but yeah, I think it's mostly just the voting. Oh, and I think I meant, I don't think I mentioned, but um, there's also the newly enacted Voting Rights Act in New York. Um, and we've helped support um, that as well, just making sure that um, people have um, access to voting in a more affirmative way. Um, looking at the maps, I work for New York State ITS, the geospatial team. How often do you use mapping to show locations looking at housing and everything else? Yeah, great question. Um, so the question was, how often do we um, look at mapping in our work? Um, yeah, I showed an example today with mortgages and housing. Um, I didn't show maps of this, but the case that I talked about with um, idling violations, that used a lot of mapping. It helped us visualize kind of like where is there bad air quality, um, where are we getting idling complaints, and kind of um, narrowing in on where there's that intersection. Um, the Airbnb report that I mentioned um, was like one of the first cases that the team worked on and that used mapping to look for illegal Airbnbs. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with them with the other cases that use mapping. <laughs> yeah, we use mapping quite a bit. Um, a couple of other examples that come to mind in the opioids work, one of the things that we look at is uh, pharmacy deserts and being able to map where pharmacies are located um, versus other kinds of demographic information that we look at this for And uh, eviction is very expensive as well. It's a project where yeah, we're looking for particular landlords that are evicting a lot of tenants and if there's there's a common um, racial disparity there, and uh, understanding where those were located and the kinds of How, what percentage of your projects do you involve some sort of 
Oh, 23? Yeah. It may be something right. Um, so the additional answer to that question was um, opioids. We've looked for pharmacy deserts and um, and um, eviction disparities. We'll look for landlords that are evicting a lot of tenants, and that um, will be mapped as well. Does the public have any way to engage your team? To engage the team? Yeah, so for example, like, like I'm, I'm on a community board, right? And uh, I'm trying to do a project in relation to Con Edison. But Con Edison, you know, their data is all within the firewall, apparently, and they don't want to share it. So let's say if I can engage your team, is there any way for, for the public to engage your team? Um, that's a good question. So the question was, is there ways for the public to engage the team? The example given was you're trying to access Con Ed data as a member of the community. Like, for example, right, so basically in my area right now, there's a huge issue with gas leaks, right? Like, mm. gas leaks in general, right? So I've been trying to get the Con Ed and ask the question, you know, can you send me the addresses where the block of where these gas leaks happen? And maybe we can just, you know, say that, you know, um, Block 194, 193 mm -hmm. has gas leaks in the house, 2, 3, and 4. Maybe we should try to change that one gas pipe yeah. in the house, right? But, you know, kind of will not share that data with us, being that that's different priority data. So we just try to seize it. Yeah, I mean, the main way that the office engages with the public is through the just the, um, like, complaints portal. But that is kind of like a much more specific question to get that type of data. I don't, I don't think that's really something that we've done before because there's kind of, like, legal reasons why we have the data, but it wouldn't be available to the public, I think. Uh, yeah, okay, it seems like Gotham is echoing my understanding. I think, yeah, the, the most direct way is to just to file a complaint with the office. Talk really about this uh, I know the office does the community engagement stuff. There is another avenue for us to learn about what's like that. But, I mean, I think as an office, it's something that we want to do. Try and do more and try and figure out how we can do more because I think one of our major problems is like actually knowing what the problems are out there for New York is the state. And, uh, but yeah, so I think right now it's probably uh, just a couple Yeah, and there's like a complaints portal and a whole team that kind of like works with the public um, through that avenue, but also just like meeting people in person, that sort of thing. Yeah, so uh, in some of the examples you gave, like the voting locations one, it seems like what you're doing basically is you're using some combination of like, I guess that was all open data, right? And yeah. You're just sort of demonstrating a disparity, like sort of straightforwardly. Uh, but it seems like there are other cases where, and like the home ownership report is one of these where like you want to adjust for mm -hmm. certain kind of like potential confounds. Um, and I know that wasn't a legal action, but like I'm curious, like are there like cases where you run regressions and that's like, Comes a part of like a legal complaint, or yeah, I'm just sort of interested in how that adjustment kind of how it works in a legal context. Yeah. Um, so the question was like, how often do we kind of just look at the face of a disparity in a kind of descriptive statistics way versus how often do we like make a regression or do other so sorts of statistical tests that um, that control for different factors in that way or just shows a statistically significant difference. Um, the answer is kind of just like what the case requires um, and like what the legal standard is. Um, so for example, in our policing work, um, often that will require kind of like a more complicated statistical test. Um, but yeah, for the voting access thing, it's like you can just see where white people live and where people of color live. Um, and that's like a lot more straightforward. Um, but yeah, it kind of just depends on like the legal precedent um, and like what it is that we're um, asking. Um, thank you. I have a question um, I think similar to uh, the content question. Um, you mentioned early on in the presentation that um, one, uh, something that you'd like to do more of is like looking for bad players and like going from there. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering like in those instances, um, is that self-directed by the team or is there like a like a probable cause or like a law, like law or policy like comes to with a request. Mm -hmm. If it is self-directed, how, how do you decide on like a priority or a focus? Um, yes, great question. Okay, so the question was um, in the strategic enforcement cases where we're proactively looking for targets, how much of that is self-directed by the team versus how much of that is driven by um, like requests from the attorneys or other people at the office? Um, 
Yeah, I think when we've done that before, it's been a little more driven by the team just because like we're more in touch with what sort of data is out there that's even possible to look into. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the team has been like kind of understaffed for for a while. So that's why we haven't done that sort of work in a while. But um, but I actually submitted my like performance evaluation on Friday that included goals. And I was like, I would love to do that sort of work again once we um, have more people. So yeah, that's definitely kind of like a personal interest of mine. Um, but yeah, I think it's mostly been more like we just kind of know what sort of data is out there. Um, but, you know, obviously, if there were like requests um, or priorities identified from the office, then we would, um, you know, do whatever it is that they ask. But that's that's also the type of thing that's kind of like much lower on the priority list than like active cases that we have to do where there's deadlines and stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of why it's fallen by the wayside um, when we've been understaffed. So I have two questions. Um, so you distinguish two types of data, public data and subpoena data. Mm -hmm. um, generally for the cases are at like, what would you say, like are you relying half the time on public data and then subpoena data or more on subpoena data? That's the first question. And then the second question is, um, where, have, can you maybe give us examples of data sets that you were surprised that helped you? Mm. Um, like with a case and do you have any examples of just like unusual data sets that people might not have thought of? Yeah. Um, okay. So the first one is easy. Um, the question was um, when there's public data versus subpoena data, how often do we rely on one versus the other? Um, I think like we very much heavily rely on the subpoena data and usually the public data is more to kind of like flesh out the context um, or like yeah, kind of provide demographic information. Um, yeah, the examples I said, it also used data available on open data. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think like that's kind of like a little more secondary to most of our work because whatever it is that happened that's illegal is usually going to be in that company's records. Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, have there been instances where I've been surprised that a data source um, was helpful and I like didn't really expect that or didn't expect what we found. <sighs> okay, this is hard for me to think about. I mean, honestly, those map like this is a kind of well-known phenomenon, but seeing those maps of where bank branches are versus where people live, like that was really shocking to me and it was much more stark um, than I thought it would be. Um, I'll invite Gotham to answer this one too, if you have thoughts on the second. Yeah, it's a good question. I think the one that comes to mind is the civil rights data collection. This is a data set that the, um, uh, that the Federal Department of Education collects the Office of Civil Rights. And uh, it's one that I think it's collected every couple of years. Um, we were primarily using it to look at uh, school discipline disparity. Um, but and so in that context, it has data from essentially every public school in the country on, uh, on enrollment of students by race and ethnicity, and then also suspension of students by race and ethnicity. It was surprising to me that that exists. I didn't know that that existed until, uh, until that we were looking into that as part of the investigation. But that's one of those data sets where it's it's a vast data set. There's so many elements in that around education that we have begun to look at. But it's surprising. The example given was um, data from the Department of Education um, that we used to look at um, suspension rates by race and uh, disparities in school discipline. So I know that uh, you know New York State has an open data, I guess, policy. like. Um, and so I just wonder, like, um, given the, where, like, uh, your team, like, your like, attorney general stands, like, um, is it totally, if, if, let's say, is there ever, can you imagine a future where, like, there's some kind of open data approach to, like, the way your office or makes available any of, because I imagine, like, all these data sets you folks clean would be very useful for other people. But I know that there's, of course, sensitivity around the need, like, you know, legal sensitivity mm -hmm. it, but uh, is there any kind of thought at that level you know in terms of like 
how your office can be part of the open data yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the question was, um, how are we thinking about taking the data we use and making it available to the public on something like New York State open data? Um, yeah, I, I do think that most of the subpoenaed data is like protected, but I feel like even with the public data, we do like we do some cleaning and um, kind of consolidation that probably could be useful to the public, like with the public data. Um, yeah, I definitely like that idea of, um, like kind of being part of the community in that way. Um, yeah, kind of another pipe dream since we're still understaffed, but, um, but yeah, I definitely like that idea. Do you ever, uh, hi, do you ever take um, like tips or suggestions from the community about who have done research on different ways of looking at the data that might reveal uh, more bad actors like I, I'm doing some research and I know that there's a high number of complaints on 311, a high number of violations, a high number of fines, um, and a high number of lawsuits against a landlord mm. from their tenants, mm -hmm. and a, um, a very high number of lawsuits, um, housing suits against tenants to get them out of the building. The actual number of, of evictions very tiny hmm. because in housing court they make it go away for like five thousand dollars so the whole process of uh, gentrification and pushing tenants out is very much alive but what you might be looking at is if it's if it's just eviction data you're not going to find mm -hmm. it in some stories and this is when it works and then you also look at high numbers of violations mm -hmm and um, very high property or quick property value increases, which could only happen if they got rid of a lot of tenants. Mm, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, my question is, there are other ways of looking at the data that I've seen, and I'm wondering, like, how can we engage with you to, you know, kind of help you see things in a different way and mm -hmm. might actually reveal more wrongdoing? Yeah. Um, so the question was kind of how do we like take input from the public who might have more specialized knowledge in looking at the data in a certain way um, so that we can kind of take those methods and apply that ourselves. Um, so yeah, so I'd mentioned um, kind of eviction rates. Oh, and the example given was landlords um, and how you might not see what they're doing in eviction rates. So yeah, I'd mentioned eviction rates. Um, we do look at violations in HPD data. I, mean, I think you mentioned 311 as well. Um, yeah, like it's not like we only look at evictions, but I think you're right. There probably are things that you know that we might not know, especially, it sounds like, do you work with tenants directly? It sounds like you do. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, yeah. yeah, I work, yeah. <laughs> I have to be your example. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> totally fair. Um, I work, with, I know, I, 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 see the, I see these patterns, but it just seems it's not actually, it's not seen through the right lens. Yeah. So. Yeah. And the like $5,000 you were talking about where they might like it wouldn't show up in evictions. Is that like they offer them $5,000 to like voluntarily yeah. move out? It just, happens, it just happens like in housing court to make the whole thing go away. And then there's no record of it except for um, the housing court cases that just are dropped. Mm -hmm. And then um, the number of like, what you have to look at, too, is the number of cases that the tenants and tenant organizations bring against that landlord, regardless of um, if the eviction, other evictions go away, because there are there's going to be a lot of lawsuits that you're not looking at. You're just looking at like three one one. Right, right, yeah. Is there a particular landlord, or do you not want to say? Totally okay if not. Is there a particular landlord, or do you not want to say? Right now. Okay, okay, it's totally fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good point, um, that there are definitely people kind of on the ground who might know more um, about how to look at things than we do. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I would say the same thing, that like we have the kind of complaints portal that like the people who professionally um, like take input from the public use. Um, this sounds like specific enough where you could message me on LinkedIn. It's right there. 
Um, but yeah, um, definitely love to learn more <laughs> in a non-recorded setting. <laughs> Yes. Um, so the question was, do people kind of specialize on the team or do people work across all the different bureaus? Um, yeah, I I don't like I think it's kind of more driven by just like what is needed at the time and who has capacity. Um, like, you know, we can kind of share like I have a background in this area. Um, I, or I just be interested in learning more about that area and the leadership of the team will kind of like try to connect those two things. Um, and also if you like have a background in something, but don't have capacity to take it on right now, you might not be doing the coding, but you would be involved with, um, kind of advising and like thinking through the methodologies. Um, but yeah, I'd say we kind of lean more towards like generalists rather than being more specialized. I feel like I'm probably one of the more specialized people on the team where I have done a lot of consumer finance and um, civil rights work. Um, since you guys are so under staffed, do you guys have any internship programs or anything like that? Where... Yes. Um, so actually, the internship program, we just closed applications like a week ago. Um, but we are hiring a data scientist right now. Um, so yeah, so that's on the website. Um, I think it's open for like another month. We just posted it this week. I have, I have really love the presentation. I had a quick question to the example you gave around um, you guys were looking at the common patterns in text to see like fraudulent comments. Mm -hmm. um, was that common pattern pattern identification? Was that like the smoking gun, or were there other data sources with, like with the pattern and the, that was mm -hmm. the fraudulent comments? Yeah. So the question was um, in the pattern identification in the FCC fake comments case. Was that the smoking gun, or were there kind of other clues? I know most of the case was supported by like internal communications at the companies who we're committing this fraud. Um, yeah, for the specific text analysis we did, I don't remember if that was like kind of the proof or if it was supporting. I, I would imagine they were talking about that internally. Like it seemed like something you would have to do on purpose. Um, but, oh wait, no, they did talk about it internally because they'd made a comment where they were like, this would be hard for anyone to detect. Like only the NSA could do it, but we're not the NSA, we did it. <laughs> um, so yes, they did talk about that internally. I'm remembering now. <laughs> So to follow on that, there are a lot of genuine organizations that give people templates to fill in, yeah. to submit comments. With. Yeah. So I imagine it was related, but it wouldn't it doesn't sound like it would be enough to say, like, oh, these must be fake. Yeah. Because a lot of people use templates to submit their own comments. Yeah, that's a good point. And I've done that um, just as a member of the public commenting as well. But yeah, I mean, like, a big part of the case was just they were using people's identities who had never consented to even making these com comments. They didn't even know that. Some people like saw their name online, like talking about something they didn't even support. So they were like, what's going on? Like, I don't like that. Um, I think one of the people was even deceased who had submitted a comment. Um, so yeah, that was kind of like the main issue there. I'm just curious, once you've uncovered wrongdoing, what do people usually say in their defense? Once you've uh, shown a certain amount of disparity, do they say, well, this percentage isn't high enough to be illegal, or do they just deny that it happened altogether? Yeah, so the question was, once we've identified wrongdoing, what is the um, target's response? Um, it kind of feels like they'll just like look at the law and kind of use every argument that they can in their favor. Um, like Our work kind of really is bound by you know, like there's obviously like what is true and what is happening, but it's also bound by just like what the law says. Um, so yeah, so for example, on price gouging, they came back and they were like, well, we're allowed to maintain a certain profit margin. And then we now like we're arguing about like, is that profit margin maintained in these calculations versus those? Um, so yeah, it'll kind of depend on the case and like what the law says. Okay, cool. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. <laughs>